So I want to welcome everybody here. And this is our, our January event for our Pediatric Stroke and Brain Injury Education Series. I'm Mara Yale. I coordinate this series with, uh, with the panel uh, parent council. So um, we're excited to have this topic about adaptive play and learning today. And before we dive into that, I'm going to start with some intro slides about the educational series. All right, so welcome everybody. We are excited to have Alex Dunn from Enabled Play sharing about adaptive play and learning today. And this is part of our 2022-2023 educational series, which is our third academic year of offering these webinars um, in support of families who have been affected by pediatric stroke or brain injury. Just as a reminder, stroke can happen at any time during the lifespan, and it uh, has the potential to affect a child and their family throughout the lifespan. And care is not only in a medical setting, but really in the whole world. And so we're taking it today into play. As a disclaimer, this is for educational information purposes. We are um, not offering medical advice or care. And if there are questions um, that you wanna ask, please try to keep them general and applicable to um, scenarios like, like the one that you're experiencing. Just to uh, highlight what we have to offer you beyond today, we started these events in 2019 in person. <coughs> And we are now in our um, fourth year. Because of the pandemic, we started these virtual webinars and we have a whole library that we're building up on YouTube. And I will share these links that are here in these slides. I'll share them in the chat so you can grab them. And I'll also send them out with a survey uh, this afternoon after today's session. Um, we are consistently offering uh, nine or 10 events every year now and typically one or two in person that are for the local um, New England crowd, but most of them are virtual like this. And we're always open to topics and suggestions that you may have. So at this point, I'm gonna stop my share and I'm really excited that we have Alex Dunn here uh, and I'll let Alex introduce himself. He's, um, he's gonna share his personal story through his family's experience, as well as his experiences um, developing this company, Enabled Play, and what it helps facilitate for kids and their families through um, amazing technology that really, I think, is like universal access for play and learning. Thanks, awesome. Alex. Yeah, thank you so much for having me, and it's it's great to meet you all. Um, I'm, I'm excited to share a whole lot about not just enable play, but kind of um, a lot of different resources around adaptive play, uh, using play in education, um, using play-based therapies and, and all the sort of different use cases in between that we can share. Uh, we'll also be able to do a couple of different live demos for people that wanna try things like controlling Minecraft using their face expressions, you'll be able to just come on video and, and use Enable Play through my computer. Uh, or if you even want to control this robot behind me, uh, we can do that as well. So it'll be a lot of different fun things we'll be able to try today uh, and a lot of just different resources to share. Um, but like Mar said, I'm Alex Dunn. I founded the company Enabled Play um, back in 2021, but the research and development that went into it started back in 2019. And for me, it was uh, a very personal story and reason um, that I sort of got into this space. Uh, I have a brother who's, who's 15 years younger than me. Uh, so he's a teenager, just to age myself a little bit, um, who, who lives with a few different disabilities. And, and essentially, I, I was at my parents' house uh, in New Hampshire. I'm from Wilmington, Massachusetts. So shout out to all the, the Massachusetts people I see in the chat as well. Um, and this was like right before COVID. So right at the end of 2019, uh, I was up there at Christmas and, and was watching um, my brother basically try to play Minecraft and Roblox um, with myself and my other siblings. We come from a really big family. There's seven of us in total. Uh, so we're all trying to play these different games together. And 
essentially what I started to observe is that using a controller like a Nintendo Switch controller or an Xbox controller um, was difficult for my brother, Brian. And uh, not just difficult to, to keep up, but there's a lot of sort of like side effects that came with that difficulty. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about some of that stuff today in general. Um, but really, it came down to him getting frustrated, not being able to keep up uh, with the rest of us or, or with his friends he was playing with either. Uh, and then sort of started to uncover a lot of the, the compounding issues that, that come along with that. In, and not just in playing Minecraft and Roblox, but in keeping up with schoolwork, for example, or um, playing games on his own, or just re, you know, sort of retaining that social group that a lot of people use play uh, as that sort of um, that sort of center for for the relationships that we shared, especially through COVID, when we couldn't all be together in person all the time. Um, so I sort of looked at it from a very analytical way, which was that it wasn't that he he couldn't comprehend what he wanted to do and and then try to execute it. It was that the physical controller was limiting for him because he lacks a lot of dexterity in his fingers. Um, essentially. I, I come from a background in applied artificial intelligence. Uh, I do a lot with voice and speech recognition and computer vision. And so I took that problem that I was sort of analyzing and I took my background and, and started trying to put the two together to offset essentially what was difficult for him with the physical controller with new inputs, with using voice as an alternative, slowly leading into uh, using face expressions and body controls and virtual buttons that were easier to press than the, the physical ones. Um, and started to learn a lot more about the space, meet more people, have more people try what we were doing to the point where, um, you know, we basically realized that, that it was going to work and, and was a big solution that we could bring to more people. Um, and so we went from uh, I, I say we, I'll get to a little bit as to why I say we, because uh, now we have an amazing team, but even originally there's a lot of people behind me. Um, but we, we decided to create the company called Enable Play and actually start shipping products. Um, so the, uh, I'll share my screen so I can kind of get into the slides, but I, I want to talk a little bit about that, that sort of impact that things like controllers and keyboards really have and, and what we call uh, in the technical world, the human computer interaction paradigm. So we'll get a little bit technical at first, uh, but we'll be able to sort of uh, back into a few different things. As I go through a lot of this stuff, please feel free to throw uh, messages in the chat with questions. Um, I don't know if, if Mar and Patty are going to be cool with it, but I'm also cool with people coming off mute and just interrupting me uh, and asking questions. The, the more we can sort of be interactive and, and sort of talk through how we, we use play, the different tools that are out there, um, I'm hoping that, you know, you can sort of walk away today um, comfortable with what's what's out there to use uh, for you, for the people you work with, uh, or for your own family as well. Um, yes. <laughs> First interruption. <laughs> yes, interrupt me. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we totally, we, we love the interaction. One of the things that, that we really strive at in these webinars in, in this community is in creating community, guys. So please, um, let's make this a dialogue. And also, if you don't want to interrupt and you don't know what, what part is the right time to do it, you can do it in the chat. And maybe, Alex, if I see something that is really on the spot or yeah. Mara, we can interrupt you. <laughs> People yeah. don't unmute themselves. But Totally. I, I've got the chat up on this other monitor, which is if you see me sort of looking over here, uh, I'll peek at it every now and then. Yeah. But if there's something I miss, <laughs> definitely, definitely get in my face about it. Um, I also see there's some SLPs. We'll talk a little bit about some of that stuff. People from all over the place. Um, really, really excited to, to see this, this sort of community come together. And I'm excited to share some of this stuff with you all. Um, so quick sort of resources and, and details, right? So we're going to talk a lot about play and a lot about learning. And, and really what we're talking about is how we're able to interact with technology, um, especially uh, doing that with uh, any type of disability, not just uh, you know pediatric stroke and brain injury, but there's a lot of other um, things that can impact your ability to play and your ability to learn at the same pace or at the same scale. Um, real quick about me, uh, I'm Alex Dunn, and I'm, I'm in Wilmington, Massachusetts, but you'll likely make maybe find it a little bit easier to find me online as Suave Pirate. There's a funny story behind that because obviously it sounds silly to be a professional uh, and have such a, a ridiculous name as my sort of handle. Um, in, in the space of technology and software and AI, Alex Dunn is a shockingly ordinary name. Uh, and so if you wanted to find my work, 
previously, uh, it would be a little bit difficult to do that. So um, I got into software engineering when I was probably like 10 or 11 years old. Uh, and I wrote a little name generator. And I, when I was sort of first getting into to setting up all my different online accounts on Twitter, or even on, on LinkedIn and GitHub and, and streaming on Twitch, um, I used that name generator I wrote as a kid. And the first thing that came up was Suave Pirate and it sort of stuck. Um, but I'm a Microsoft MVP and uh, also is inducted into the Game Awards Future Class uh, for basically the work with Enable Play and, and empowering people to play games together. Um, Enable Play as a company, we're on a mission to level the playing field for people with disabilities in schools, in workplaces, and in play. And play can mean a whole lot of different things, um, not just you know competitive video games or playing Minecraft. It can also mean uh, just in, enjoying the, sort of the, the digital world a little bit more. Um, you can find all the Enable Play stuff online on our website at enableplay.com or on any of the socials. We're just at Enabled Play uh, just about everywhere. So one of the, the sort of things that we look at in, in leveling the playing field and, and really the compounding issues that we try to solve is uh, stems from the fact that we, we introduce technology at, at younger and younger ages, um, especially in the U.S. and Canada. Uh, and in, in Europe, we, we started to observe and, and do some research on when are kids basically getting involved in using technology in their day-to-day -day lives. And typically that starts with either at home or at school. Um, and nowadays, most kids are introduced to using some form of a computer uh, at essentially ages three and up in schools. Uh, this is especially true on, on the coast um, of, of the U.S. in terms of the research we're looking at. Uh, but this is, it, I think personally, it's, it's a great thing. It's a good thing to introduce technology uh, because it, the whole point of it is to accelerate people. Kids can do amazing things. Uh, if anyone's ever participated in a first robotics or first technical challenge, uh, which came out of the New England area, um, we, we use technology to teach kids how to build and automate and, and to unlock the creative side. But it's also the modern way that kids stay connected uh, remotely and the way that a lot of us adults do. For example, none of us are in the same room. I shouldn't say none, but I'm not in the same room with any of you. We're connected digitally right now. And that's continuing to be uh, in an, an important aspect of how we communicate and stay connected with each other. The problem stems from the fact that we introduce that technology at a younger and younger age to accelerate, but when it's not accessible to someone with a disability, not just not accessible at all, but let's say it's just slightly less accessible, those people are going to fall behind at that same accelerated rate. And in a way, we kind of slipped and fell into a systemic issue. Um, and it's not really the fault of any given person or group that decided that, uh, but there's new tools and resources out there to sort of curb that. To give you sort of an idea of the larger numbers and the challenges in tech access in the U.S. specifically, there's about 7.2 million kids in special education that struggle with technology access specifically. There's more than 7.2 million kids in special education, but this is sort of the group where there are dexterity and agility issues, uh, fine motor control challenges, uh, gross motor control challenges, or learning disabilities that impact their ability to use a Chromebook like the rest of their classmates. There's 39 million U.S. Americans that want to work uh, and have a motor impairment that impacts their ability to use a computer in the workplace. And in the gaming and play space, there's 33 million uh, gamers with disabilities. And there's a lot of technology being driven out of all three of these areas to try to basically walk back that systemic issue that we've sort of created. So let's talk about it a little bit more on the technical side and a look at how we control and, and actually interact with technology, whether that be in play, whether that be in schools, or whether it be what we're doing right now with, with staying connected. Um, and I wanna kind of give a little bit of history on these different, what we call human computer interaction paradigms. Uh, the most used period in all forms of talking and using technology is a keyboard and mouse. When we look at a keyboard and mouse as an input, it's been the same for a very long time. However, it's also a lot harder for some people to access and use at the same speed. And essentially, if you can't type at the same speed as someone else, you're going to be falling into some sort of disadvantage along the way, whether that be it takes you longer to write a paper than it does your peers, or whether that be that it's hard to play a game with a keyboard and mouse when you're trying to keep up with your friends. Um, we have one person to blame for this in this case, that's Christopher Latham. Oh gosh, what's his last name? Christopher Latham Scholes. This guy didn't create the keyboard, but he did create 
the QWERTY keyboard layout, which has been the exact same thing since the 1800s in terms of how we talk with technology until we introduced things like touchscreens, uh, touchscreens and, and game controllers. And now we have these different modalities for communicating and touchscreens created a lot of new accessibility. The first modern day touchscreen was created as an assistive technology device for someone who son had cerebral palsy and could not use a keyboard. Apple then went and purchased that company and incorporated it into what was the very first iPhone. It was this sort of drive to break through that human computer interaction paradigm that was the keyboard and mouse uh, in order to make it possible for someone to have any level of access. And now it's something that most of us use every single day as a way to, to interact. Some other newer ones that have advanced since touchscreens, although there's a little bit of this beforehand too, is voice as an input. It's a little bit more ambiguous, um, but it's now using modern machine learning in order to understand that you spoke something and we want to do something with that. Uh, how many of you have used a, uh, you know, an Alexa speaker or a Google speaker or have used Siri on your phone? Or if you're a Samsung user, have used Bixby? I'm sure it's probably most of us at some point. Statistically, it should be just about all of us that have done it at, at some point. And that's another computer interaction paradigm. That's another way that we interact with technology. But when it comes to access across all threes, and not just access in general, but equitable access to a keyboard and mouse, to a game controller, to a touchscreen and to voice, we're at the will of the people who are building those to, to make them accessible. Uh, and that's what essentially Enable Play set out to change. But I wanna talk, before we, we dive into the tools, uh, why even looking at these really matters. And to give you a little bit of an existential crisis, uh, because I do this to myself all the time, um, I like using this website called keysleft.com. The idea is essentially how quick can you type and based on how quickly you can type, what can you do for the rest of your life with that? So for example, I type all the time. I'm in software engineering. I live my, my life on the keyboard um, or I use enable play, but we'll talk about that later um, to type. And I type at about 120 words per minute. So about two words per second. And so when looking at my current age into the, the life expectancy that, that I would have and spending half my day working or, or half my working day, then also typing. Um, it basically means that I have 428 million uh, keystrokes left, number of times I can hit a key. That means I can write 3 million tweets. I could write 142 novels. Uh, I could write 857 computer programs, which like, that's really scary. Cause that's like, that's what I do. And now it's like, there's your number. <laughs> that's all you got left. Make those 857 count. Uh, enable play being a big one or 42,000 love letters or uh, 2 million emails uh, to my boss. But we look at all these things and that, that's a lot that I can do as someone that doesn't have challenges with dexterity, that has the agility in all 10 of my fingers and the ability to type extremely fast. Looking at situations where you have an impact to a single hand or a single side of your body, for example, and now you're talking about cutting that in half because you only have the ability to use five fingers at the same time. Uh, or beyond that, if, if it's even more challenging, this is that compounding issue come to life because it becomes harder to type as fast or as accurately, which means that it takes longer to do schoolwork, which means that lessons in schools are, can move along without you or slowly leave you behind and or that you have to sacrifice other activities in order to keep up. And I wanted to share one story uh, from one of our families that we work with. Uh, that has a, their son has a genetic disorder called CTNMB1. It's a very rare genetic disorder that only impacts a few hundred people in the world. Not to get into all the details of it because I'm not an expert in it at any capacity, um, but the way that it sort of affects him is that he loses dexterity in his hands completely. He, he doesn't have the fine motor control over his fingers and it tends to affect him on one half of his body more than the other. So his left hand is, is still able to type, but there's also periods in the day where he kind of loses that uh, over time. He also has uh, uh, situations where he'll lose sensation in his legs. Um, and basically he was going into middle school. This is a, a quote from this, uh, his mother, Tracy, um, from this summer when we first started, uh, working with them and they were really, really concerned about his schoolwork because going into middle school, all of their schoolwork was now done on Chromebooks. 
Uh, so it was no longer uh, writing on, on paper where he was able to use his customized grip for his, his pencil. Uh, and he had the ability to move his wrist and arm just fine. Uh, they were worried that he wasn't going to be able to type as quick. He also really wanted to play football this year. It's the first year that both his parents would allow him to play football and there was a football team for his school. Uh, and their, their big concern was that he was going to have to spend so much more time using his computer uh, to do things like write their papers for their English classes or create their presentations in, in PowerPoint or, um, or Google Slides for uh, his science classes or to use their the program they use online for submitting their math homework, but they have to always be typing out the answer instead of writing it. Um, and they were worried that it meant he wasn't going to be able to spend as much time with his friends. It wasn't going to uh, be something, it wasn't going to be an option for him to play football, basically, because it was just going to take him so much longer. And the IEP that he had also wasn't really doing him any service because it still required him to technically do all the work because his disability wasn't considered profound enough uh, to get something where he had custom homework built for him because he technically could use the computer and that was their limitation. Um, he started using Enable Play in the summer, learning how to use uh, voice commands and virtual buttons instead of the physical ones that were hard for him to press. Uh, and now he's on the football team, which is an amazing story. Uh, but also he's even doing his homework sometimes faster than his friends, which gives him uh, some awesome bragging rights. Or one uh, from another family of ours where they have uh, two daughters and one had a, a hemispherectomy. Uh, oh my gosh, I'm butchering it. Hemispherectomy uh, at age two. Um, and basically she lost the ability to move her right hand at all. Uh, and then also has some input delays on her left hand, but she does have like the full dexterity and agility to use it. And so when she turned about five, they introduced playing like basic games to her and her sister, who's about the same age. Um, and they, they wanted to be able to play together. And this, this to me hit home because it's very similar to the story that got me started in enable play, which was trying to play simple video games with your siblings uh, and watching one have a harder time because she had to play one-handed. Um, now, you know, she uses enable play, but, uh, and then also again, getting into why I started it and, and for my brother, Brian, uh, being able to play games like Minecraft at the same pace uh, or the same speed as both his friends, as well as uh, myself and the rest of my siblings. So we can actually enjoy these, these types of games together to play these things as a group. And so that, he can develop more friendships. So we kind of like to categorize the levels of these different interactions um, because this shows the different places where it starts to become a, a challenge or starts to create that, that compounding issue. Uh, so for example, we look at, at the starting point we call casual use. That would essentially be you pull up like a YouTube or Netflix and you want to go to the next episode, or you need to pause it. There's maybe you know a single input that you have to hit. There's no requirement to do it at a certain pace. There's not a lot of complex inputs. It's sort of one button at a time. And we get into more complex things like writing. Now you need to use just about every key on a keyboard, but you can sort of do it at your own pace. It's only impacting you uh, when writing becomes challenge. Then we get into solo play, where now it's not just a flat board in front of you that you can play one-handed, you're using a controller, and using the controller becomes challenging to do one-handed, although we'll talk about the tools to overcome that. Um, but again, you're playing a game by yourself, therefore, uh, it's really only impacting you. And then we get into where these inputs and these different interactions create more problems, because it's not just a problem for you, it's more of a group problem collaborative work with others for schools that's you're going to work on a group project and now your ability to type fast enough or to navigate your computer fast enough uh, impacts not just yourself but also the people you're working with and then in the play side competitive and collaborative play playing minecraft with your friends all the way to you're playing against other people and now it's not just a disadvantage that's impacting your your fun that you're having but it also becomes extremely frustrating when other people are able to be better than you simply because they can use their computers more easily. So overcoming these challenges, there's kind of three different categories for the types of technology out there. You can adapt existing technology to make it easier to use. You can also use physical adaptive technology, uh, and then you can use augmented adaptive technology. You can actually use a lot of these things at the same time. So let's talk about one-handed gaming. 
uh, and about a controller. I'm going to actually stop sharing my screen for a second so I can try to share just my video because I'm going to pull some stuff up in front of my face and hopefully I can like find a way to highlight myself or actually, Mara, I don't know if there's, oh, here we go. Spotlight me. Yay. Okay. Uh, I'm going to take a, a simple controller. This is a PlayStation 5 controller. Uh, and just to kind of break it down, right, there's there's two joysticks. And then typically there's there's four buttons. There's going to be a directional pad up, down, left, right, X, circle, square, triangle. If it's an Xbox controller, this is, you know, A, B, X, Y. Uh, there's pauses. There's also this little touchpad here. And then there's two different sets of triggers on the back. So typically when you're holding a controller with your hands, they are designed for two hands and to have symmetry. These joysticks are at the same level. These buttons are at the same level. These triggers are at the same level. When you need to start adapting that to using it without basically using all 10 fingers or both hands symmetrically, now you get into the fact that it's not designed for it. And so you need to adapt this physical device. And there are ways to do that without anything else, just being able to basically take this controller and use it one-handed. For example, what a lot of people will do is instead of holding it and gripping it like this, they'll lay it flat. And then they'll use their hand on the joysticks with a single hand. And that's very common. But the problem is now, and maybe you can like sort of reach over and get these different buttons. But it's challenging to get to the back, right? To be able to move joysticks and then also reach around with a single hand. Uh, or even to be able to do things at the same time. And this is where we sort of categorize like in gaming, uh, basically one button, joystick and single button to like complex inputs. If I need to like press the triangle and one of these triggers, and move the joysticks at the same time, that's near impossible uh, with just one hand. Except that there are some amazing tools and people out there developing these tools uh, to create one-handed modifiers for joysticks. So for example, on this right one, this is the exact same controller I was just showing. And this is for someone who's, who's able to use the right hand. The left one is for people who are able to use their left hand, but they basically follow the same thing. So to sort of break down the what's happening on the adapting side, uh, we take all of the buttons on the right and see now there's these 3D printed plastic sort of like sticks or stems that, that move out. And now there's buttons for each one on that hand. And so basically if you were to press this circle button, it's going to rotate this arm and press that button in, uh, which is pretty cool. You can still use the joystick, the left joystick with your thumb, or again, if you're on the right side, use the right joystick with your thumb. But then there's this elastic based mount for your leg that is then holding on to the right joystick, or in this case, the left joystick. And so you can move the controller physically against your leg in order to move the joystick. So basically, and that's why this guy is sort of showing it on his leg, uh, being able to move the controller around on the leg is moving the joystick. All the triggers and the other buttons are now available exclusively to the left hand. Um, and these can be printed uh, for free from groups like Makers Making Change, who will be able to ship these custom modifiers uh, to you, uh, as well as groups like Able Gamers Charity and Special Effect that both help design some of these things, um, but also uh, are a resource for getting access to them. So this is sort of a, the what we typically see for modifying one-handed controllers. There's the same sort of thing for like a Nintendo Switch controller. If you're using uh, the pro controllers, the individual joy kinds are, are a lot harder. Um, and then there's also the same thing for like Xbox controllers as well. However, it's still, you know, is not perfectly even because you're still using one thumb now for basically eight buttons, uh, instead of what I can do as someone who has access to all 10 of my fingers at the same time and, and press those all at the same time. So it's still a little bit more challenging on the controllers that are built to be adaptive. There's essentially one for each of the different game consoles. The first one that came out is the Xbox adaptive controller, which is what you see here. I have one, so I'm going to show you a little bit more about how it works. Um, but essentially, this is an Xbox controller, just like how I had the PlayStation controller, except that it's flat and you can see these two giant buttons that also have the most satisfying click. I don't know if you're going to be able to hear that through the microphone, but it's like ASMR. Uh, it is just beautiful to be able to hear the, the clicking. Um, and so what you do instead of using a physical controller is you use custom switches. So you can see there's sort of buttons and switches here, as well as joysticks that can plug into these USB ports. So I've got some in front of me and I'm going to stop sharing again and keep the camera highlighted so you can see them. Uh, so this is the Xbox adaptive controller, just to kind of give you an idea for like the scale, my giant head, it's about the size of, uh, these buttons are, are about the size of a hand. 
and it's the A and B button. So the whole space can be hit and you can hit it from anywhere, including like the tiniest little corners. The D pad is also much larger comparing that to, for example, the size of a regular like PlayStation controller. Uh, it's much easier to get these, but then the back is where you have all these ports and you can see there's one for every button on the controller, the A button, the B button, X, Y, all the triggers, the pause. And so there are groups that make custom switches. There are also large companies like Logitech that makes entire switch kits, which I'll pull up a big box for. This was made in partnership uh, with the Xbox team. So this is their adaptive gaming kit, different buttons. And so essentially what you do is you take one of these buttons and I'll pull one up here. Again, very satisfying clicks. Um, and they have these little, uh, basically they're, they're aux cords. They're, they're two channel uh, aux inputs, the same you would plug into headphones, for example. And so you just take it and you plug it in, you choose which button you want it to be. So for example, if I want it to be uh, this trigger here, I just plug it in. And now when I connect this Xbox controller to an Xbox or to a PC, this button is the same as if I was hitting that trigger, uh, which is pretty cool. But you can make you know a whole custom setup for these because they can have really long cables. You can do things like mount them to headrests. You can also use, for example, uh, some of the ones that I've built like foot pedals where I took a, a guitar foot pedal, but Chow also has very satisfying click and modified it to also be able to plug in. So now if I, for example, want to use any of my feet, I can plug this in to the Xbox adaptive controller. And then I can just put this underneath and now I can press that with my foot and that will be the same as another button, which is really cool. So you're able to now create your own custom setups with any of these different switches. And again, groups like Makers Making Change and Able Gamers and AT Makers and Special Effect. And Mar, I see you going through and finding all of these. Um, let's see, Warfighter, Engage, Cerebral Palsy Foundation make some of these too. And then there's a lot of individuals out there essentially working on creating these new physical switches. So from things that are touch sensitive to, uh, to uh, twitching your cheek, just like the old um, Stephen Hawking's input, they're all the same aux cord standard plug into these different devices uh, to basically be able to use to offset any of the physical buttons. Now, the other cool thing is that you don't have to use just this. You can use that one hand modified controller plus one of these with whatever switch setups you want at the same time uh, to create all those different inputs. Pretty great. So the Xbox adaptive controller works for the Xbox and it works for PCs. So you can plug it in and it works like any other controller. For the other platforms, for Nintendo, Nintendo partnered with a group called Hori, that's H-O-R-I, and they created this Hori Flex. You can see it's the exact same concept, but now this is for the Nintendo Switch. So all the switches, and I was Nintendo Switch plus switches, great naming. Um, all those same physical buttons and switches that you want to use, if you want to use it on an Xbox adaptive controller, or if you want to go use it on a Nintendo Switch, you can unplug them and plug them back into the same thing. It's a standard across all these devices, which is nice. So this button, for example, that's here, that's plugged into this B, you could also go use and, and uh, plug into that Xbox controller as well. Then literally like a week ago uh, at CES, Sony announced their new project Leonardo controller meant to basically provide the same thing because basically before a week ago, there was no way to use any of these adaptive controllers without kind of like hacking together a whole bunch of stuff on a PlayStation, whether it be a PlayStation 4 or a PlayStation 5. And so they worked with the same community, the same groups, Able Gamers and Special Effect uh, and, and, and so on to design a brand new controller, which looks like this. So there, these are all different switches out of the box. But you can also unplug these like little, um, I don't even know really how to describe them. They're kind of different shapes and stuff too. Like some of them are kind of lift up. Some of them are larger. Um, and you can unplug them and then plug in another custom switch too. And just like the Xbox adaptive controller, uh, you can also still use a regular controller uh, alongside it as well. So however you want to either modify that uh, or if you want to uh, completely replace it uh, or even just have someone else use that controller and then the other person use one of the adaptive controllers, you can. Uh, some of the challenges, of course, with all of these is that they're really expensive um, and they're not compatible with each other. You can't take this Project Leonardo and go use it on an Xbox uh, or on a Nintendo Switch. And each one of these is usually between 
uh, 100 to 250 dollars without any switches so now you have to then go buy switches custom switches are usually another 150 to 200 dollars um, so if you're thinking about all of that together with a regular controller which is already 90 dollars for like the the playstation one plus a 250 and dollar controller plus on average up to 800 dollars worth of custom switches that's a pretty expensive bill to to be able to play some of these games some of the other things to keep in mind when looking at play and also on on the education technology side is get familiar with the accessibility settings for example in windows and on mac and on android and on ios you can turn on voice access which allows you to use a limited set of voice commands uh, in order to do basic operations on your controller um, and you can use these types of inputs and these settings and these different ways of inputs is what we sort of call augmented uh, to augment what you would otherwise do on the physical side. And this is also where enable play comes into the picture. Uh, we are an augmented controller set to allow you to use anything else at your disposal as another input. So you can use voice commands and dictation. You can use face expressions. You can use body gestures. Uh, you can use phone sensors and smartwatch sensors. You can use your hands and virtual buttons. You can use your eyes. You can use custom hardware. You can use these switches. Um, and you can do that for any of the same inputs uh, that you would otherwise use a keyboard or a mouse or a controller. Uh, so it's not just an Xbox controller or Nintendo controller, and it's not just a keyboard and mouse. Uh, you can use it across all these different use cases. Um, so I wanted to go back to sort of how I got into building these and a little bit of the backstory again that I mentioned earlier with doing some of this research and development and experimenting. Uh, and I wanna share a video from the very first version of the prototype of Enabled Play that was using Snapchat as an input as well as voice commands. And so if you're not familiar with Snapchat, it's a social media app uh, that does like cool camera lenses and stuff, but you're also able to build your own custom lenses as a developer. And so we built one that would detect things like raising your eyebrows or opening your mouth or doing different hand gestures like a fist or, or pointing a finger up and it would flash a QR code. So what you're seeing on the sort of bottom left over here is Snapchat on my phone. Um, and whenever I do one of the gestures, one of these white boxes will show a QR code. And then there's a different app running on the computer that was reading the phone screen and then said, hey, we got you know the eyebrow raise QR code to show up. That should be jump. Um, and so this was all done on a live stream uh, during all of the research and development. I was live streaming on Twitch, uh, how to build all this stuff. All these videos are out there if you feel like checking them out and more. Uh, but we're going to play a little bit of Fall Guys uh, using face expressions, hand gestures, uh, and so on. So I just want to share this little video with you first. Every time I take a drink, I'm going to have to like keep my coffee down here so I don't have to use my hands. So I'll be like... All right, this is a good one. I gotta like, I'm gonna end up like doing like this and like punching my coffee. All right, we're playing one handed. So I'm gonna keep my other hand here so I can just be like, oops, be like real quick. Just to see if it's working, I'm gonna use my eyebrows. A little jump, a little fist, jump. There's the jump dive. All right, we're off and running. So every time I'm raising my eyebrows, I'm jumping. I'm not using any other inputs on the computer um, and doing it all one-handed with, with the gestures that I was doing there, which is pretty cool. Um, go back into this. So again, bringing all these different inputs together, we have two ways of doing it with Enable Play. We have our physical controllers. If you check out my video uh, over here, I'm holding it up in front of my face. I don't know if you're able to see my, my video and my screen at the same time, but it's a little palm-sized box. Um, and you can also plug in other things into it via the USB ports. It has microphones built in to do the speech recognition. Um, and you plug this little black box into any computer or into a console, um, and then you control it from the app. We also have uh, virtual controllers, which are all software. Uh, and so basically you just run an app on your computer and you use the app on your phone or your tablet, and you can start to control uh, your computer in that way as well. The way that you sort of build these things out, there's two key parts, right? There's the devices. So whether that be a physical controller or the virtual ones, and then you create profiles for different games. And a profile is basically what input do you want to use and what do you want it to do when you do that input? 
Uh, so for example, you're sort of seeing in the, the animation on, on the side over here uh, is I'll create a, a profile for PowerPoint. So not for a game, but I'm going to create one where I can tilt my head to the right by choosing the, the face or body expression from the list. So I'll do tilt my head to the right. And then I can also choose to tilt my phone to the right by saying tilt your device right. Or I can give the voice command of go right. And then I will say that's the same thing as the right arrow key. So you choose those different inputs. And now I'm scrolling down to say that's, that's the right arrow key. So now if I tilt my head to the right in front of the expression controls, it's the same as if I physically press the button or if I give the voice command of, of go right and so on. And so you build these profiles for either the different games you're using, the different programs you're using, or you can use any of these existing profiles that we've created or that the community has created uh, for any of these different games or inputs. And so you're never gonna start from scratch. We have profiles for every type of game and all these different programs. Like, although I'm showing, you know, sort of stepping through and building one for PowerPoint, we already have one for PowerPoint. Um, and once you have a profile, whether it's one that's already been built or you create one from scratch or you customize one, uh, you then go to your device page and choose the inputs you want. So because the microphones, for example, are built in, you can tell it to start and stop listening. Uh, or you can have it automatically start listening, and then this doesn't really matter. All the voice commands run offline on the device. Your voice is never streamed to anyone. Uh, you know, it's not like when you use uh, an, an Echo Dot or a Google Home or anything like that, where your voice, when you say something, is going to Amazon or going to Google. It runs all offline. It also learns to adapt to your speech patterns. So if your speech patterns are affected by your disability, that would impact typical speech recognition like in Alexa or Google. This starts to learn how you speak over time. We also have support for what we call nonverbal vowel sounds. So for the SLPs in the room, we're able to detect the discrete vowel sounds and diphthongs and also turn those into inputs. Uh, so you can do things like do discrete ooh, ah, and e, uh, and all the ones in between and choose those as well as spoken commands that are sort of written out. Uh, and use those as different inputs too. And you can also use dictation and voice commands at the same time. Dictation meaning that it's typing what I'm saying as I'm saying it. Uh, so for example, if I'm using PowerPoint, I can use voice commands for something like create new slide, tab, enter, add a text box, type this is my title, add another text box, type this is the body of what I'm trying to say in this slide. And so you're giving both those commands and then also explicitly telling it to type something that you say. And whenever you pause, it then goes and, and finishes the dictation and writes it out. We also have tilt or motion controls. So this little uh, black dot floating on the blue squares, it's almost like balancing it on your phone. And so if you tilt your phone to the left, the black dot slides uh, down into the red square. And once it does that, it, it triggers an input. So it's almost like these, these typical uh, joysticks where it's up, down, left, right, but it's using your phone for it instead. And you can increase the sensitivity from really, really tiny movements, like single degrees of movements, all the way to having to do full 90 degrees. Uh, you can also do different shakes. Uh, one of the most common inputs we've seen is people will use shake for backspace. And so they'll write something up and then they'll take like their tablet with handles and they'll just like rage shake it uh, and it'll delete whatever they are writing, which is pretty cool. You can then also use expression controls, which turns your phone or your tablet's camera into a controller as well. Basically turns your face into a controller. And so you can do things like raise your eyebrows, tilt your head left and right or up and down. You can lean backwards, lean forwards, lean left, lean right, um, smiling, stop smiling. You can also do things like fishy faces or teeth gritting as an input. But what's really cool is you can also control the sensitivity for each of those movements. So for example, if I want to uh, open my mouth, but I can't open it very far, I can increase that sensitivity so that I don't have to. Or on the other end of that spectrum, if I have spasticity in my movement and my mouth is always sort of up and down moving, I can decrease the sensitivity so that I have to open it very explicitly sort of extra wide uh, in order to trigger it. And so you just go in and there's little sliders that, that you choose um, to basically step through. And yes, I tomorrow like an Etch-a-Sketch with the shake to delete. It's awesome. Um, we'll also be adding expression combos. So being able to say, if I tilt my head to the left note and open my mouth, that can be different than if I tilt my head to the right uh, and open my mouth. We also have virtual buttons or uh, what are called hotkeys. So basically you add a bunch of buttons to the page and they show up in the app. 
So you can do things like turn your phone into a touch sensitive switch with one mega button or a tablet with like take an iPad and it's one gigantic button to do something. Um, maybe that can be your delete instead of shaking it. So you can just be like hand down on an iPad and that's, that's backspace. Um, but you can also add a whole bunch of them and they just get smaller and fill the screen. Um, but it's not just for a single input. It's not just this is left click or right click, or this is the space bar. Uh, you can also have them run macros like copy and paste that you see here. And so you're able to just tap them uh, however you want to. We also have uh, partners like Makers Making Change again that um, build hardware that also works with Enable Play. You can also plug in other physical existing inputs like a keyboard and remap the keyboard. So if you, for example, wanted to use arrow keys for moving the mouse, you can do that or a space bar to click, you can kind of remap those too. Alex, um, are you seeing Eska's questions? You're talking all about the extensibility and the flexibility, mm -hmm. but that also comes with a cost of a learning curve and programmability. So can you um, sort of explain how it would work for an individual? Yeah, so we have, the, there's the two different things to, to make it work for yourself as an individual. There's the profiles you use, and then there's the settings for the device. Um, typically what we recommend doing is using one of our existing profiles uh, that has all of the different inputs built in, and then you're just customizing it where you want to. Also, most of the settings adapt over time uh, to detect your face movements and how far you are moving and are able to move. However, the settings can also just be explicitly changed. Um, also, we partner for groups that are working as an organization to work with many people. We'll pre-build custom profiles for you so that you just have them to, to basically get off and uh, get up and running really quickly. And it's all done in the app. There's no programming or anything like that. It's all just step through like, what face expression do you want to do? Tap. What do you want it to do when you do that face expression? Tap. Okay, now go do it. Patty, you asked a question, uh, do kids using Enable Play tend to change the way they use the commands? I wonder if they have any information about how they learn slash change their use. Um, and yes, Eska, there, there's tons of existing profiles and we're always adding more and you can share them too. So even if you customize one, you can then share it to someone else. Uh, we also kind of track like the legacy of profiles. So like, for example, um, let's say someone has an issue with using their right hand. And so they make a sort of like left-handed focused um, type of profile. They can share that out, but then someone else will take that and be like, oh, I'm going to actually make a couple changes uh, and make a difference for how I use it personally. And then they can share that version out. And so everyone kind of gets the baseline built up, uh, but can then can also customize. And yeah, we could definitely make right hand versus left hand profiles. No problem for a lot of these things we already do, or we basically like have profiles that were at least everything you would do has a voice command. Um, and so you like, typically you like the way we see the most value is combining basically whatever inputs are going to work best. And so if the more that's packed into a profile, the sort of better, and then it's just up to you, which ones you want to use. Um, Alex, so, sorry, Patty, I didn't mean to skip over your question. So no, 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 no. I, I'm, I'm wondering how much, is it dynamic for the same kid? So do they kind of get bored and then go to another one or do they get better at it and then they add another command uh, with a different, like I'm just thinking about from the brain perspective, is there also like a, a learning curve to use that command and that profile, but do they also tend to be dynamic in their profiles? Do you have any experience yeah. on that? Or I just yeah. wondering how, how does this stimulate new, new experience or not? Like. I, yeah, great question. Um, I can actually share a video. It's actually, I think it's literally the next slide that kind of talks about what we do for recommending when you're first trying it. Um, and typically what we say, especially for like face expression controls is start with one and get familiar with like, okay, you're using your face to control, you know, a technology that, that can sometimes feel weird uh, when you first do it. So start with one and we have a list of like recommended simple games to try. Uh, for example, this is one of our users, Jackson, he's paralyzed from the shoulders down. Uh, you can sort of see him, he's using the face expression control. So it's like him on the side, he's playing this little basketball game. And so what he's doing is he's using eyebrow raises to move the basketball up and you have to like kind of time it right and, and like get familiar with like, okay, I'm raising my eyebrows to raise the basketball and then have it land in the hoop. 
Uh, and so if this is like, especially for younger kids, they're, they're not familiar with the other types of inputs already, uh, or if they've sort of newly acquired their disability, then we typically recommend a sort of slower approach. Um, for voice, it's a little bit different though, because for voice commands, you can pack in a lot of different commands for the different programs you're using. And it actually feels a little bit more natural because we're used to talking to people. We're used to talking to our technology now. Um, and essentially it, our goal with voice commands is to basically let you just tell your computer what you want it to do. So for example, even with this profile where Jackson's able to raise his eyebrows to move the basketball up, he could also just say up or shoot or click um, with voice commands at the same time. And those would be the same inputs or in PowerPoint, it could be new slide. And that's how you would think about, I need to make a new slide. If you basically just say, make a new slide, that voice command sort of maps into the actual action. Or if it's a game and it's like jump, run, um, open my inventory, things like that, that we, we basically try to pre-populate voice commands for. The times where it gets even, where, where that really doesn't work well for people is if they're playing really, really fast paced games with voice only. Uh, so for example, if you wanted to play a game like Fortnite and you were only able to use your voice or you wanted to use your voice for primary actions, saying something like switch my weapons and open my parachute might take too long, but you can use very, very short form vowel sounds or discrete sounds like ah, e, uk, one, two, three, and, and basically use shorter form sounds as an input instead so that you can do them really, really quickly uh, and in succession. So that's, I guess, a long-winded answer, but the short version is we usually recommend, uh, especially for face expression controls, like start with one, then add another, then add another, then add another. But with voice commands, it's just use a voice command for whatever you would otherwise do. Uh, so just to share this video a little bit, you'll be able to see him sort of raising his yeah. eyebrows and saying yay every time um, yay. and seeing it go in the hoop. <laughs> Which is pretty fun. Good job. And yeah, so yeah. I, know, I know there's already been a lot of links in chat, uh, but I wanted to share some of the other groups. Um, there's also uh, health systems and pediatric systems that are starting these adaptive gaming clinics as well. For example, Texas Children's Hospital has released a whole bunch of resources about what they do. Um, and to sort of recap some of these things, I want to share a little bit, some of the quotes from some of our users. This one is from uh, this guy, Aaron. He's a peer counselor at Able Gamers uh, and is a quadriplegic from a spinal cord injury. And he talks a little bit about some of the stuff that I shared today, which is that the sort of adaptive gaming scene in terms of the tech it's kind of a mess. He calls it a hodgepodge. Like I said, you get a whole bunch of wires and stuff uh, and everyone's disability is different and it impacts the way they want to play a little bit differently. Um, so it, there's a learning curve to, to understanding and, and building the right setup, whether that's in enable play and you're using the app to build profiles, or if it's with, you know, an adaptive controller like this and tons and tons of switches um, it's, it's hard to, to build these things up and, and tr also try not to, spend thousands of dollars on it um, and instead be able to, to build something that, that adapts to you is what our goal is. That is one price that's approachable for anyone, uh, is customizable and flexible and can be used for a lot of different things. Uh, and when I mean used for a lot of different things, I mean just about everything because essentially with Enable Play, anything you would otherwise use a keyboard and mouse or a controller for, you should be able to either replace or augment it with these different types of inputs that work for you. Uh, so from things like playing games to creating PowerPoint slides to controlling robots, which I'll let you all try in a little bit, to uh, gamifying speech therapy sessions with using face expression movements and, and using those to create inputs and turn otherwise repetitive inputs or dosages into inputs for playing a game. Um, there's a lot that you can do uh, with just different ways of thinking about how we control our technology. Um, so. That's all the, the core stuff I wanted to share other than more and more demos. Um, but I figured it might be good to do that uh, based off of questions people have and also give everyone else a chance to try it uh, as well. Thanks so much, Alex. So we want to invite people to ask questions and you can simply unmute to ask or if you want to type in the chat, I will... Um, read your question or call on you. 
and and Alex really is inviting us to interact in real time yeah. because he he, as you can see, is incredibly facile with this technology, yeah. and the technology works um, works even in a multi person environment like Zoom. So so let's try it out if um, if anyone just wants to volunteer. Thank you, Alex. This was great. I'm like totally not a tech person i hate technology i hate computers i'm like <laughs> i've kept it away from my kids like yeah. their whole life and now it's creeping in and I, like, I can't stop it and i know it's like coming and i'm trying to do it in like the best way and like find research the right games because i never grew up with video games yeah and it's really overwhelming but it's so good to know that i even thought about like the nintendo switch but then how is he going to do it with two hands so this is really great to start yeah. becoming a little more comfortable with it, but I still distrust it. <laughs> well, I've got an answer for you. One of okay. our partners is called the Family Gaming Database. And they this was built off of a, um, an author uh, wrote a book called Taming Gaming. So the website is Taming Gaming. And essentially it was to kind of like demystify gaming and the use of technology, but really especially video games and the kind of issues people have with it. Things like the perceptions that, video games cause violence or it's it's something that you can't really use for learning and it's you know melting kids brains and everything else in between and they wanted to break through that stigma uh, in a lot of different ways and so they they've done it in i think a brilliant way which is hey if you wanted to use a game to to teach a kid a lesson maybe it's for example they have things for uh, teaching kids how to cope with losing a grandparent and they have games you can play that are story based that uh, they can go through and discover um, and, and learn those sort of lessons of empathy or lessons of, of loss and, and everything else. On top of that, they also have an amazing database of accessibility settings in games and games that you can, for example, play with even a single switch, um, which I'm going to try to find that list because this is massive. Here we go. Accessible game search. Um, there's different types of, of information within each of these different games around like, hey, here's what you need to play it. Uh, but also, let me try to find a list. I should have had this up ahead of time, but uh, lists. There's one from, um, basically, it's called One Button Games, which is awesome. And I'm trying to find it because it's a great place to start. But there's things like design for autistic uh, diversity, things that are uh, built for different types of colorblindness, things that you can play one-handed. Uh, there's lists of games where, yeah, I'm um, trying to find that one button list. It is somewhere in here. I promise. Oh, it's literally right here. Great. Um, so games that literally only need one button. So if you're trying to introduce someone to playing a game, and especially with an adaptive device, whether that be enabled play or an Xbox adaptive controller and one of these buttons, the idea is that you can play these games in this list and discover the ones that are going to also um, add some other type of value by pressing the single button. Even games like Mario Kart, which I, I always found to be, um, have amazing accessibility settings. So you can play, of course, with a full controller, but you can also, in accessibility settings, turn on auto drive forward and automatically keep me from driving off the track. And now the single button is just for throwing items, uh, for example, or geometry dash, where you're a little cube that needs to like time flying over different things. And these are also the same games that we use as recommendations to introduce people to using things like face expressions, if they want to use it for gaming, because you start with one input, uh, like we saw Jackson doing with floating the basketball, you can do the same thing with Mario Kart to, to throw an item, I'll, I'll just use opening my mouth, for example, or then you start to take away some of the accessibility settings and start to use enable play for things like tilting my head to the right to turn right, tilting my head to the left to turn left. So now I don't need auto steering, I can actually steer with my head if I want to, or again, with any other joystick or other input device, but then still use mouth opening. So there's adding a little bit to the learning curve, but also I recommend checking this place out for understanding the right ways to approach video games uh, for like specific lessons or, or to really find the ones that are gonna work best for your kids. And I'll put this, uh, this one button games one in chat. So do we have other questions or somebody who wants to volunteer? And if you don't want to volunteer, I'll, I'll, I'll show some other stuff too. Yeah, I'll do the choice. demos myself. 
Yeah, Alex. Um, so I one, I really appreciate the the connection that you made between gaming and kind of further learning and participation class wise down down the road as you're using technology. Out of all of these that, that you've kind of shown, <clears throat> is there differences across age groups? Like obviously, would one work better, more suggested for say kindergarten age versus middle school or high school, just as far as ability? Yeah, great question. So um, when it comes to the different types of tools, and I'll just go back to the slides so that I can pull them up with the images as examples. Uh, things like the one-handed adaptations are really hard if you have small hands. Like physically, if you're a child with small hands, it is hard to reach your thumb, for example, from all the way down here to all the way up there. Um, and it, it can be a lot easier to instead set up custom switches on top of using, you know, an existing controller to, to tap through and move around. Um, when it comes to using enabled play though, I mean, we have, we have kids as young as three that use it and, and people as old as, as 93 that use it in their day-to-day -day lives. Um, just because it's, it's able to handle things like different types of voice commands and, and different face expressions. And it's trained with a lot of data from a lot of different people to remove some of the bias. But, uh, what it really comes down to is, I think less so on the physical input side in the long run and more on the cognitive load, uh, which is why even like games for younger kids tend to have simpler, more forgiving inputs where adult games, things like first person shooters and, and um, competitive role playing games, they, they have both a, a higher learning curve and more of a cognitive load, but also um, are a bit more punishing if you don't do something right. Right. So like the difference between like a Minecraft, which I'll pull up a little demo of, um, to an Elden Ring uh, and everything in between, things like this can be more forgiving if you do something wrong because you just, if you fall off, Go. You, you come back and you're just building. Um, whereas, and I'll warn you um, on, there's a little bit of video game violence in this video, um, playing really, really complex games like last year's game of the year, Elden okay. Ring. Um, and being able to, for example, Heal. only be hit twice and you die and you go you restart all okay. the way back. Uh, so when it comes to games, it's it's really about not so much on the inputs as much as it is on what's required and how forgiving is it or how Just punishing now. is it. Oh, there we go. All right, thanks. That's actually, that was part, part of what I was asking, what you hit at the first, as far as even just the the size of their hands and their, their ability yeah. to use it. So, appreciate it. Of course. Any other questions? I just have a question as well. Um, I guess I'm looking at it being adaptive to my son enjoying the Nintendo Switch. And again, there's certain games that he's really struggled and I'll have to help him with. So I understand kind of now that obviously the virtual controller would have to go through my phone. Like he's too young to have a cell phone yet. Yeah. So like that's the other thing too. So that's why I'm just wondering how is this adaptive that like I could make it work that it's at home for him and accessible for those games because he loves Roblox um, and Mario Kart. Mm -hmm. um, but yet I would like him to utilize it in school. So I would guess I'm just asking, like, would it be that what platform would be better, that virtual or I guess the actual console or controller that you talked about? Yeah, great question. So um, it, it depends on, on really what inputs he'd want to use. So, for example, for face expressions, it works best with a phone or tablet camera. And, and this is true for the physical one or the virtual one. Um, but you don't need an app, you don't need the app running to use voice commands. If you set it up initially, you can have it automatically start voice so he can just plug it in and go, or he can use the app um, on a laptop uh, or on any computer with both the, the virtual or the physical one to control it too. Uh, we're also adding the ability to use the webcam on a laptop as an input. So if he was, for example, playing Roblox on a laptop or at school and at a computer lab or using a Chromebook, uh, the goal is to be able to just use any of those existing devices as the input. So use the webcam that's built into a Chromebook or built into a laptop um, or use the phone. And, and because it's, it's any and all of these sort of inputs combined at the same time in a sort of distributed way, it's really, we want to make it so that whatever you have, you can start controlling more easily. Um, so you don't need to have, you know, a smartphone. 
You don't need to have like the latest iPhone to be able to use it. You can just have your laptop and that's it. And it just basically makes the laptop more accessible. Can you speak a little to um, sort of the, the tools that you have are very generic and might be able to grow with a child yeah. as they use multiple different consoles through the years? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, going back to, to all these other um, adaptive and switch-based devices like the Xbox and the PlayStation um, and, and the Nintendo one, you know, as, as a lot of, a lot of kids will start with like a switch or they'll start with browser games uh, on a computer or even with, with tablet games, which is a whole other thing. Um, and then grow into using an Xbox, using a PlayStation, getting a gaming PC that can play more complex games. Um, it becomes a challenge when you're using adaptive controllers like the, you know, Sony's project Leonardo, because it only works in one place. And so if you want to then bring it somewhere else, you have that challenge. Uh, we, we want to be able to let you control any of these different uh, devices from a single controller. So you can just take this little guy and plug it into your computer, take it out, plug it into an Xbox, take it out, plug it into a Chromebook um, and basically be, be set up for the, I'll say like the, the most success and, and the most flexibility. But beyond the consoles you're learning, it's also a useful tool for adapting to the learning curve of these different inputs. And that's where we sort of start with like, especially with young kids, it's use one face expression, but then use voice commands. And as you get better at it and older, it becomes a lot easier uh, to use a lot of different inputs at the same time. And, and in the play space and in the education space, it's the same reason why we start with introducing technology that's simple, ABC mouse, for example, you just need the, the mouse cursor and the clicking, maybe a little bit of keyboard. Then you get into like, well, you're going to start writing papers and typing for the first time and you, you type to learn. Uh, and the same thing is true with gaming. You're going to play Mario Kart, which has a couple different inputs all the way to that, you know, Elden Ring, which needs all these crazy complex things at the same time. So our, our vision of it is in, in how we approach that problem with enabled play is something that is easy to start with, easy to start to learn, but then can also become extremely flexible uh, as you start to figure out how you're best going to use it. So for example, I'll actually pull up a live demo because I've got Minecraft open and I have my phone. So I have my, my Minecraft running on my PC. My phone is plugged in. You're just seeing it. So like I can move my, my finger up and down here. And then I have my enable play controller. And for example, I can show you like the different profiles we have. We also have tons of built-in tutorials that can step through and walk through what you, you need to do. So if you're like, how do I even do these face expression controls? There's already a built-in uh, tutorial that steps through like how it all works, how to get started. Uh, you go in and you tap, you wanna use which different input and then you open up the camera. It's my face again, you're never gonna get enough of that. Uh, talking about using head positions versus face and smile and mouth-based commands versus eye-based commands um, and starting from uh, the sensitivity settings. All of this is like self-guided and, and sort of step through, but at its simplest version, I can do things like go to my enable play device, which you can see is connected both online and over Bluetooth. I'm using this existing Minecraft profile. I can tell it to start listening with the microphone. I've turned off because I'm speaking so much. Um, I can use these virtual buttons like mine and inventory and jump and place because those are the most common inputs. I can use tilt controls to move it uh, or I can use expression controls, which will do this countdown and <laughs> I can see another angle of my face and I can do things like open my mouth and that's click. And start there. But I can also, and of course, it's going to be doing it all the time with all these different inputs because I'm still talking. I can smile to open and close my inventory. But I can also raise my eyebrows to place a block. Um, and then open my mouth to mine them away. And still use any of these other inputs like move around if it's easier with a joystick or with um, one handed on a keyboard, which is what I'm doing now. Uh, so I'm able to focus on whatever I want to use as a physical input uh, for movement, but then be able to augment the other things that would otherwise be hard for me to do one-handed um, by using my face essentially as my other hand. So everything that I would be doing with my right hand, I'm now doing with my face, uh, like mining stuff and placing stuff or opening my inventory.
I think for me, what's so compelling, it's it's very hard to talk efficiently about how you can set up a controller for a game or for a learning environment. Yeah. Um, but the extensibility, and I, I have a, a software engineering background as well, the extensibility is so powerful because you can um, test out different gestures or facial expressions and see what's going to be fast enough to be responsive in the setting um, of the context you choose. Um, exactly. It takes a lot of words to describe what you're yeah. showing. <laughs> Sorry, it's smiling to open the inventory when we go back. Um, yes, it, it is. It's hard to describe. And, and I think, you know, in, in a session like this, I wanted to explain all the details, but getting started is, is not as difficult as it probably feels right now because I'm trying to show you all of it. Uh, I'm trying to show you that extensibility. Um, getting started can be as simple as going to the profiles that we have, choosing the app or the game that, that is already there, looking at the summary of it. So you can say like, okay, well, what are the, the face expressions that we want to use? Um, so in, or the tilt controls, and this one is already packed with a lot of stuff. So you can see like that, raise your eyebrows or using voice commands for place or block is the same as right clicking on a mouse, which in Minecraft is to place a block. Um, but you don't have to start from scratch. You go in, you create a profile, you go through the command builder. If you want to even create something completely from scratch, you just go and say, okay, well, well, what, what do I want to use, right? Do I want to use a face expression? Do I want to use a voice command? Do I want to use a key? And everything starts from how you want to control it. So if I want to do a face expression, I just choose which one, maybe it's lean back. And now it's, well, what do I want that to be? I want it to be the same as clicking. So now if I lean back, that's a click. And, and that's all it really takes to, to get started. Um, and then there's, of course, the, the rest of the, the inputs. I mean, there's, of course, a lot. And I'm realizing that the Minecraft is uh, <laughs> playing its music now. So serenading us. So yeah, we, <laughs> that was. Um, we, we have a question. Um, Aaron, do you want to come ask yours? And then Jordan, you'll be up next. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to ask about the pricing, I guess, because I was just I was looking at that online while we're talking and that that the, the physical actual controller that I know that does most of the voice recognition, you can't do the facial expressions, but um, that that there was a price on your website, but yet it also discussed about the virtual controller, which I think give everything um, that there was a monthly and a yearly subscription. So I just wanted to know more yeah. about the pricing. So the physical controllers and the virtual controllers both can do all of the inputs. So for example, what I'm doing with those face expressions and stuff now is going through this physical controller. Um, the difference is basically for a physical controller, you plug it into something and your, your phone or your app or your tablet or your computer is talking to the box. The virtual controllers have all the exact same features, except there's no box. You have to run it as a different app, which is why, for example, if I go back to my list of devices, um, you can see I don't just have a bunch of physical controllers. I also have like my Surface 2 and my Mac and my gaming desktop and um, all these other different um, laptops that I use and test with because these are all uh, virtual controllers versus this just enabled play device is the physical one. So just to clarify, face expressions and voice commands and motion controls and virtual buttons work on both of them. Uh, the physical controllers we retail for $250. We do discount that for partners that are buying them, for example, like school districts we work with or gaming companies we work with or workplaces and otherwise in, in recovery and rehab centers too. Um, and then the virtual ones, we price at $120 per year or $10 per month, basically. Um, and again, we discount those for, for organizations that are using it for lots of different people. Jordan, do you still have a question? Hi. Thanks, Alex. Gosh, so much helpful information. Um, I only have, don't have like so many questions because I can't like hope to achieve the level of cool and hipness to even understand most of your presentation, but that's why I'm so glad it's like recorded with all the links. So as my seven-year-old gets into it, I can refer back. Um, I have a question on whether you have thoughts around like um, working on these things in therapy versus yeah. adaptive or in conjunction, because, you know, when we're still in that, like, 
like, oh, if he's doing OT or PT, like what are his interests? And it's like, oh my gosh, it's he all might be game. interested in Legos. Let's yep. do that. Yeah. Spirit crushing interest killer immediate. <laughs> like he's into <laughs> like the little Nintendo, you know, thing that we were playing Mario Brothers circa like 1980s with yeah. me. And then it's like, oh, well, maybe we can work it into that killer. So again, like what's the right mix? Yeah, definitely. So we we do work with a lot of um schools in the special education departments as well as rehab and recovery centers that use enable play for explicitly therapy uh, both physical and a lot in speech um, the the use cases are are basically let, let's take for example jackson's video where he's moving a basketball up and down and you're trying to do a lot of repetition either as a physical movement or as a certain sound that you're trying to to um, get the kid to make and you want to basically, instead of just having them do it and either correct them or um, have them use it in, in a non-feedback given way, then they're actually using it as a way to play. Um, so for example, I have a little video here showing on the more on the speech side, doing teeth gritting and bite movement uh, as a basic input for another type of game. Now, this is just me doing it because I didn't want to share any videos of, of some of the kids we work with without their permission, but this is me doing that sort of like teeth widening or teeth gritting movement. I can also do like puckering and basic mouth opening. Um, and then on the physical side, for example, we work with UCLA uh, and the Cerebral Palsy Foundation to use motion controls in enable play uh, along with um, some of the other devices they have to do like leg movements as a way to input to play uh, or arm movements. So this is a little bit of a stretch to explain, but bear with me. I can, for example, open up the enable play app and go to motion controls or tilt controls. And basically what people do is they'll use like an arm strap or leg strap for a phone. The same thing you would use if you were running and you had it like strapped to your arm. Um, and then when you're moving your arm, the phone is moving and the tilt controls are moving. So I'll try to actually show you like, I could do it with uh, curling for example. So I'll just set it as a baseline and now I'm resting my, my phone on my arm. And as I lift my arm up, the tilt control is moving. You see the black dot moving uh, from like my resting position all the way down to all the way up. Um, and those are also added as inputs. And so instead of just doing the motion repeatedly, they're doing it to play a game. Uh, we work with groups like the Neurodriven Recovery Center in Vegas. Uh, they're part of the Conquer Paralysis Now uh, Foundation. And the, it's basically a whole big gym for people with spinal cord injury. And they use this for uh, arm movements and developing more leg movements by doing exactly that. Like, okay, we're going to do like two pound curls over and over again. We're going to do a hundred reps of them over time. As you start to redevelop that muscle, um, they strap a, a phone to their arm. And as they move it, they're playing like 2K uh, and they're playing basketball, like video games, or they're doing simple games and, and competing with people next to them and stuff too. There's there's a lot of different use cases because in the end, it's it's taking these movements, these sounds um, and motions and, and whatever else you want and using it as an input into anything. So because it's, it's so flexible, there's a lot you can do. Uh, we're working on a lot more content to basically say like, here's the this specific type of, of speech therapy uh, program you can run doing these types of inputs. Here's how we recommend doing it. We have uh, two SLPs on staff. Our chief clinical officer and our chief learning officer are both um, amazing speech language pathologists and oral facial myologists, as well as occupational therapists um, that have worked all over the world. And, and are, we're now sort of developing not just the technology side of it, but the programs behind it to be able to bring it to real therapy sessions and, and make it easier to just follow the program and, and be off and running with it. And just to add, Jordan, I, you know, I think the beauty that I see in, in some of this is that it's so applicable to every different thing, right? And, and as kids get older, as our, our kids are getting older, one of the things that I liked about it is that it allows them to access those age appropriate games. And certainly it can be used in a therapeutic manner, but it can also be allowed, given them access to Roblox or Minecraft, where they can play with their friends and they can do the social aspect and it, it doesn't have to be therapeutic, but you could change the inputs, right? You could change the inputs for therapy time where now mm -hmm. instead of it being as fast as possible, he's working on something in particular where he can use a totally different game and, and not, and not, you know, delve into ruining oh, okay. that, okay. that super like a little... fun game that he loves, right? And yeah. I, I do think that it's- Compartmentalize. Right. Yeah. 
<clears throat> but it, it's it's so easy. The nice part of IC is that it's so easy to program those different controls that you can change them pretty quickly and say, okay, for therapy we're doing this, but then when we go back to to playing, we can do it in sort of the, the easiest, quickest way. Right. Cool. Any other questions or anything? Actually, um, I was interested a little bit, if you could speak a little bit more about uh, <clears throat> using it for, for things outside of gaming, like how you briefly kind of touched on PowerPoint and, and things like that. Yeah. So, so as, as um, somebody was just saying, like, you know, as they grow older, yes, the gaming is cool and it gets them into it, but then this seems like yeah. a really good tool for utilizing those for in-school things to help so they don't fall behind educational wise. Yeah. So um, let me actually have a video I'll share. Um, I'll also put it in chat. Uh, for example, like using Excel, like mm -hmm. and, and controlling it with voice commands and, and taking essentially the, all the, you know, <laughs> tons of things you could do there um, and instead making it possible to do with voice as well as even writing code. So I guess I'll, I'll get two videos I'll share. Um, and then I'll put them in chat so they're easier to to just get right to, um, and then I can play them as well for people that are not looking at the chat. So that is using Excel with voice commands. And then I've got one for writing code with voice. Um, the writing code one with voice is fun. So I, I do a lot of speaking at like software developer conferences. Um, and one of the, uh, I, sorry, I guess I actually just sent it to one specific person instead of sharing it everywhere. So let me, didn't mean to DM you there, Catherine. Um, I do this fun thing where I talk about like more on, on the machine learning side and stuff that goes into enable play. But um, basically I have people compete with me and I say, Hey, here's, we're going to, we're going to write code against these, like these two different challenges. You're going to make a for loop that does this thing. And then you're going to add a button to a page that does this. And I say, if you can do it faster than me with your hands, then I can hands free. I'll give you an enable play controller. I haven't given one away yet because we've been, uh, We've, we've never lost when you can speak it faster than you can type it. But these are examples of uh, being able to do things like high level Excel controls or PowerPoint or Word. Um, and I've got tons of different video demos there. So let me share my screen. I'll pull up the Excel one uh, first. And I'm realizing now, I think I shared the same link twice instead of the Excel one. So let me do that. Okay, and hopefully the screen share will play nice. All right, let me know if you can see that. I'll start it over. It's just a short minute 20 demo. Enabled Play can make Excel and Google Sheets and other spreadsheet-based software easier to learn for students and also easier for professionals to use faster. We can use voice commands for basically every common thing we want to do, including moving and navigating about within the sheet, but also within the program itself. For example, we've got the fitness vision template from Excel here, and the idea is that we're going to get the percentage of each of the goals reached, and they should fill out the rest of the sheet to the bottom. Rather than having to go and select each cell and copy the same formula across the board, we can use voice commands instead. Fill. Tab. Fill tab, fill. So we've seen the spreadsheet update right away without having to use the cursor to navigate around and without having to remember every single keyboard shortcut. But we can do a lot more than that. Select, copy, new sheet, paste. We're even able to navigate around and control across different sheets using common voice commands faster than we can do with our hands or if using the keyboard and mouse isn't as accessible to you, you can use voice commands, face expressions, virtual buttons, motion controls, and more. So basically there's a voice command for like everything in the ribbon bars, which in a tool like Excel or a PowerPoint or Word, as I'm, I'm sure most of you know, there's like hundreds of them. Um, so basically we, we pre-built voice commands for all of them. So you can just say, for example, like turn on wrapping text, add a new row, 
uh, above this one or uh, do a new formula, sum this, this column and not just like for each thing in the ribbon, but also those more complex tasks. And so it takes the, the learning curve from, okay, you need to learn Excel or Google Sheets as a tool and you need to now learn why you're using it and how the sort of concepts come together. It really focuses on more of the concepts and takes away the like how to remember where every single option is all the time, um, which just makes it a bit easier to learn. Also like in the long term, just faster to use. So for you, I know, and maybe you can stop sharing. I'm gonna ask you something. Um, for you as an expert user of enabled play and a incredibly fast typist, um, how, what's your natural ratio of using enabled play? Like, do you easily integrate it into your workflow? Yeah. Yeah. So my, my like actual general workflow is, uh, you know, I don't use things like face expressions as much, but I use voice commands a lot. Uh, so for example, in writing code, I'll type and stub out stuff with my voice and then kind of like fill in the gaps with my hands. But then anything where I'm like navigating, creating new projects and doing things that I, I would otherwise do very frequently, um, I just have voice commands for all of it. Um, so that's that's typically my setup, um, but everyone's a little bit different. Other typical setups we see is people use face expressions with one or two expressions, and then they'll use virtual buttons for other stuff uh, alongside any other physical input they want to. Yeah, I use it every day. Um, I use it. I use it even when I'm I'm flying and like working on presentations or uh, writing code on an airplane. Uh, I still use it a little bit. So, wow. So um, Jordan asked a question specifically about Guitar Hero, and then I think we need to wrap up. Yeah. Oh, the guitar. Yeah. So big fan of Guitar Hero. It's also like Guitar Hero controllers are cool because they are they're another controller but they're like a totally yeah. different shape and stuff so uh, but in the end guitar hero controllers are the same thing as an xbox controller so or a playstation controller so you have a b x y and your triggers um and so you can also offset those with things like voice commands or face expression so like in rock band if you wanted to use your face as the drummer you could just map each one of the drum buttons to a different face movement, raising your eyebrows, opening your mouth, tilting and turning. Um, so you can actually still go through the same rhythms um, using just your face. So can totally be adapted that way, but you can also, we've seen some people use Guitar Hero controllers as other inputs for not Guitar Hero um, because it's, it's also just a, a unique Xbox controller basically. Cool, thank you. Thanks so much, Alex. This has been really amazing. And I'll be sharing the recording, um, also a survey. And we also um, are excited to bring a panel to discuss CP soccer. That's cerebral palsy soccer, um, accessible to those with CP with um, stroke or traumatic brain injury. So and it'll be um, information uh, from a panel that's relevant nationally, internationally, as well as in the regional New England region. So we're excited about that for um, next month on the 17th of, of February. And um, I'll share this video and all the links that we captured and uh, ways to get in touch with Alex or Enabled Play. Thank you again and uh, have a great weekend. Thank you so much.